Yeah, hi. So I'm gonna let me put the video on. There we go. Hello. Hi. Lovely to see you. <laughs> oh, there, isn't it? <laughs> How are you? Make all of this like full screen and stuff yeah. like that. Okay, great. Yeah, cool. I'm here. Good to go. Yeah. Lovely. It's so nice to meet you. And firstly, I just want to say thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I think everyone's really excited. Someone's just put there. I've been looking forward to this all day. <laughs> thanks for having me. And thanks for I've been looking forward to this for a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, uh, I'm going to try not to be a Larry letdown in my kind of lockdown. I'm just a mum to a three year old life. <laughs> I feel your pain. I feel your pain. <laughs> so, firstly, obviously, there's so many questions that we've got to pick your brains about. But um, my media makeup students want to know how you got into this industry, how, how you kind of got into it. So I started with. Um, a drama degree at Bristol actually I'm from Gloucester so I'm not kind of not too far from you guys and I was doing my drama degree and I was like you know without thinking about it I was sort of doing the hair for plays and stuff like that and and for people when they went out and I was running on a shoot for one of my my teachers and there was a makeup artist there and I just was like that's a job you get paid to do that for a living and it suddenly sort of clicked that it was it was maybe I'd always known I wanted to work in drama but it's sort of there is actually you don't realize when you're young but there's myriad ways of working in drama that don't mean being you know on screen and that's all quite embarrassing and frightening and it was um it was a real revelation to me so she said oh no you can go and do a makeup course yeah and 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 then I was just lucky because I spoke to my dad about it and he lent me the money and I went and did a, a sort of a very short three month but kind of complete hair and makeup course that of course is not in any way complete <laughs> and and then started the long process of learning on the job really. Yeah you trained yeah. at Delamere didn't you? Yeah Delamere yeah. Yeah and mm. is that how you kind of got into did that just open up like a whole door? No. Of, you know? They were, they were great in the sense that they definitely um, they definitely you're not kind of cut loose when you finish they keep in touch they try and set you up with opportunities and now as a designer they I have a working relationship with them and I will try and kind of promote their students but yeah. it, it was it was really just a case of answering adverts for short films on on film websites like mandy.com and talent circle and going out and working for free yeah and then i think initially most of the jobs that i got in truth and i would say this is the same for everybody through your whole career is most of your jobs will come from your friends mm -hmm. so well, I, yeah so i have found but but for makeup people, not mm -hmm. for the industry, as it were. Like I have found my makeup community to be kind of the most supportive and an important aspect of my career is 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 the group of friends that I'm in, and we all try and pass each other work, and we've all kind of climbed up. You know, we were all getting paid a pittance 15 years ago, and now we're all kind of supporting ourselves, and we're all have families, and we're still giving each other jobs and. And I think there's a kind of fear like you need to be competitive and um, and stuff with each other. But actually, I think your makeup friends are your most important tool, as it were. Yeah, definitely. And is that how you got into the makeup for the, the hair and makeup design and of the crown? No, I mean, that was obviously that's like another level. But I was so in terms of designing, I, I think my first design job probably came from applying for an advert for a freebie small mm -hmm. job and then meeting a director and and just getting lucky really and he had a feature film he was directing that was kind of no no money at all and I think there were different ways of doing it so most of my friends have started as a trainee and then have worked their way up the hierarchy of roles in the department yeah and that's like the most conventional way of doing it but I sort of started designing really quickly um, when I was about 24 and instead of I worked my way up the budget so my first film was probably a 500,000 pound feature film and the crown is like 100 million pounds so yeah. there's been quite a long journey in between of, of of getting progressively bigger budget films and and learning from mistakes along the way 
That's amazing. And was there anyone in particular you were really excited to work with? Um, as in on the crown? Yeah, well, at, it, like, I mean, I've seen your list of things you've done and the list just went on and on. So, I mean, there, yeah, there's been loads of jobs. I I loved designing Crooked House, which is a terrible film, actually. It's awful. <laughs> but it was a really collaborative, exciting film to work on. So the, the director of photography is a, is a music video photographer and he did like an amazing he did the chandelier video for Sia so he was quite visionary the director really wanted a look so half the time you're doing hair and makeup for people who just like really hate hair and makeup and don't Mm -hmm. want to see it don't want to know about it don't want to be inconvenienced by it so when you finally get to work on productions with people who have a bit of vision and you get to be really creative it's really exciting so that was a really good one and and I think it's got a real sort of look to it. Mm-hmm. And then and then the crown obviously sort of ticked all my boxes. It was my dream. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Amazing. And which look are you most proud of? I would say probably Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. Because like I know I know the Diana look is good. I knew that when we did it. It was one yeah. of those things that just came together. But I think it's a much easier sell to to, you know to make a young beautiful girl into a young beautiful girl is like yeah you, know, you just have to get the right haircut with that with the wig but mm-hmm. the, i think thatcher was a way more difficult thing because Gillian, she's she's so beautiful and she's really like in the flesh she's really really attractive i don't i've never really met anyone like her and I think to make someone like that who's that magnetic and that sexy into Margaret Thatcher was a way bigger mental leap to ask people to make. So I'm sort of, I feel like that was a, it was a, it was a greater achievement really to pull that one off. I mean, it really was because I was watching it with my husband and I said, this is Gillian Anderson. He said, no, it's not. I said, that is Gillian Anderson, it's not. And they've wanted to put us up for the prosthetics award. And I keep saying there's no, there's no prosthetics. That was all done with makeup. Yeah, so you can't, like, we can't really claim to be any good at prosthetics because we hardly use any in the crown. Wow. Um, Was that a wig she had on? Yes, yeah, she has six wigs through the show. Wow. Almost all of the principals have six wigs. Wow. Is that because of, like, outside shoots and outside scenes or...? Because, so, A, we're evolving their looks over... Yeah. 10, 10, 12 story years. So we have to have somewhere to go to tell that story. So, for example, Gillian's last two wigs, we were thinning out the hairline with hair removal cream. We were, we had grey going through it. It was wirier. The, the dressing style was less elaborate. Yeah. And, and that was all a kind of way of showing her run down and worn out. So we have, for every look that they have in terms of different colour or cut, they have two wigs because we always need a repeat because one will be on camera and the other one will be in set and dressed mm-hmm. or then off back to the wig makers to have its front removed and then put back on and re-knotted because every time you block up a wig, the tiny, we use a lot of mohair to make these baby hairs in the hairline. Yeah. It's very, very fine. And every time you block it back up, you lose and wash it and dress it, you lose fine hair. And, and as that kind of that fine work is lost. The, the hairline gets harder and harder and wiggier and wiggier. So we're lucky on the crown in that we get, we have a budget enough to have them refronted so that they always look super fresh on camera. That's amazing. Yeah, but it's that, the problem with that is that half my job is coordinating these array of wigs backwards and forward, getting couriered backwards and forwards. It takes a week to refront one and then it has to be cut and fitted again and it's a real it's it's a scheduling nightmare the crown <laughs> i can i can imagine um and you told me when we were messing you love like the period kind of style yeah, yeah that's yeah. your speciality isn't it so i suppose yeah. crown kind of like the earlier days it's just that for me because i'm a sort of history geek that was where yeah. i came from and i just um you know i love hillary mantel and wolf hall and i I just love, I love period work. So whether it's 1980s is still period, 90s is period, Mm. or 1910s, it doesn't really matter to me. I just love, I love all of it. And I love trying to get something that's authentic and and, um, everything that goes into putting something together that looks kind of palpably different from the period Mm. before. 
I found with um, Margaret Thatcher, not Margaret Thatcher, um, Princess Margaret, mm. Bonham Carter. Mm. No matter what kind of area we were era we were mm. on, she always looked incredible. Like some of them dresses she wore back then, I would wear now. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. was a real. Um, she was really stylish, Princess Margaret. Yeah. She really cared about what she looked like. And so for a lot of the royals, it's all about being very subdued and very subtle. Mm. And Margaret just was like unabashed into fashion. And um, so, you know, she had a hairdresser with her all the time. Yeah. So who designed like her dresses for the crown? So the costume designer is Amy Roberts. Mm -hmm. She's a she's a period costume designer. They um, looked amazing, didn't they? Yeah, they really did. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. And someone's just put here, what was Helena Bonham Carter like in real life? Um, I mean, she's amazing. She's lovely. She's really kind. She's really maternal. But she's a, a production. I mean, she, you've, you've probably seen pictures of her walking her dog around North London. And, you know, it takes 20 minutes just to brush her hair and sort her out so you can even start doing the hair and makeup in the morning. So... <laughs> Her call was two hours compared to anybody else. Wow. Mm. And how do you um, conduct your research for the look? So did you get any um, help from royal family? Well, yeah, so we, I have a sort of six month run up to shooting the crown. So I work um, extensively with photo research and video archive first. I collate a massive library of of images chronologically and then I've got these here in case they're helpful to show you I make these picture books yeah They're like basically a chronological bible of images so that everybody has got for their artist that they're looking after so I'm trying to do it so it's in the camera yeah that's amazing they've got something to hand and then I also because to explain how it's shot because I think this is a, something that people who don't work in film don't understand. We've got 10 episodes and they're shot in what's called shooting blocks in the schedule. And mm -hmm. you might have your first shooting block, for example, for season four was episodes two, four and five. So we don't shoot chronologically. We started with episodes two, four and five. And then we went on to shoot episodes six and eight, seven, nine and 10, and then one and three. And we do that on two units. So we have a queen unit and a king unit that are shooting sometimes in different countries on different. So we're coordinating a team. We have, a, we have mirrored teams on two units, but we have principal artists on both those teams that follow their actors backwards and forwards. Wow. And I'm fitting. So there's 250 cast per season. And I'm also trying to fit all of them with wigs and have a kind of ongoing production of new people starting. To be approved to go on camera so we also i would do then a bible of images for each shooting block mm -hmm. when you're shooting like non-sequentially and you've got all these real life people you sort of have to have this at a glance reference that you can just orient yourself because we're trying to tell this story we've got eras changing from the early 60s to the late 70s you really need to know when you're making those changes and how you're making them yeah, that's incredible. And uh, John, who played Churchill, yes, yeah, he he's actually really tall in real life, isn't he? So tall, he's like six foot three. So how did you do that? Because isn't like Churchill's quite short, wasn't he? But compared to the Queen, he didn't I mean, look. Yeah, I mean, I think he was in bed when I shot because I didn't do seasons one and two. <laughs> um, and when I shot with him in season three, he was in bed and dying. Yeah. Um, yeah. But typically, I mean, like, to be honest, it's it's a challenge that is overcome through photography, really. Um, and perspective, we've got Elizabeth Debicki playing Diana for season five, and she's six mm. foot three, I think. Wow. Six foot one or six foot three. And yeah, I've got no idea. I've got no idea how that, I just said to someone earlier this morning, I don't, I'm gonna need a box to check her wig because I'm five foot two. <laughs> so I don't know, um, I don't know how it gets dealt with in truth. It's a sort of, a mix of sometimes I guess people in heels and yeah you know perspective but it's tricky it's about, yeah. it's about camera angles and lighting as well yeah it's very interesting and how many wigs on average would you say were used on the set of the crown so I think we have about probably 75 going through the principal cast um at any one time 
70 but yeah it's probably about that i mean we have a stock of wigs we also use a wig maker in london called alex rouse and we hire hire wigs when we need to and then the crowd we have a crowd team as well so there's 20 of us in total working in the hair and makeup department plus we hire hundreds and hundreds of dailies so we have a wig stock that the crowd department use as well and then um yeah, I mean it's it's loads. <laughs> yeah, quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you how do you maintain continuity between scenes? So say if you, I don't know, Olivia Coleman was ready for bed, yeah. and you needed to pick up yeah. that scene the next day. So I mean, this is going to sound like a shameless plug, but it's not. I, as a young designer, developed a continuity app, and luckily, I can use that. So I have my app on everybody's iPads on the team, and we that's how we basically for every single scene and every character, you record your makeup notes, hair notes, what's happening in the scene, the story day, the scene number, and it's all recorded in a database. And we print them off as well, actually, so we've got hard copies if we need them. That's um, amazing. Yeah, it's a whole system. It's a whole kind of, it's a big part of the job. So good. Can anyone get that app? <laughs> yeah, it's on the app store. It's iPad only. I have to say it's a slightly, um, it's a, it's a sort of slightly sensitive thing because I developed it as a very like naive young person before the app thing really took off. I was just like working on something low budget and was like, oh my God, iPads are going to save me. We used to print everything and we used to take those little photo printers everywhere and drag huge folders to set. And I thought, well, this is, I'm just going to pay someone to make this because this is going to really sort me out. And I, what I didn't know was, when you charge people a one-off payment, of course, what you're not doing is is getting any kind of regular money to support the app. So the right. old version, I ended up putting the old version of the app because it's really clunky and outdated, just up for free. Because when I took it off the app store, so many people complained. So I've put it back there for free so that people can use it, but with kind of impunity that it's not it's not maintained. It's not. Um, I don't think it's good enough, really. Although. It's good enough that we're using it on the ground. Yeah. But, but um, we are, me and my, I've got two app developing business partners now and we're sort of pushing ahead to try and release a cloud-based subscription model, which will be a bit more up to date. It'll be a bit more modern so people can just upload all their pictures and they'll sync automatically. And That's so good. Pay for their internet storage, which is a bit more of a normal way of doing things now. Yeah. So, um, I hope my media makeup students are taking notes for that app. <laughs> <laughs> it's, called, it's called continuity pro but it's ipad only and it's free so feel free to download it on the app store thank you very much um how do you allocate time for each model do you get a particular set amount of time yeah so i mean it, it's tricky it's not like no one would be tolerating us taking three hours on each person every day um obviously although it's the crown and we've got a general shooting schedule it's still jam-packed for the seven months that we shoot so typically as the shoot goes on, people actually get quicker as well. So that's useful. Um, my fittings can take hours and hours while we experiment and play. But once we know what's happening, typically the timing is, I think Olivia was in and out the door in an hour, including her wig, because her makeup person sews really fast. And Olivia's a very like no fuss person. Helena took two hours, which is pretty long for a hair and makeup call. Um, but was partly because she'd be forever getting up and wandering off and doing stuff. Um, so I'd say between one and two hours for period. Typically, somewhere like an hour and 15, an hour and a half is about right. And then obviously, if you've got prosthetics, longer. Yeah. And what would happen if you did go over time? Would that just not happen on the crown? <laughs> I mean, it happens. It happens on every shoe, and it's just looked upon very unfavorably. So I'd get a bollocking. Um, whoever was in the, you know, the, it would be the AD department who were who were there to keep everything on schedule and make sure the shoot runs properly. They would be um, livid if we were running over our time. So they will always give you a very patronizing lecture at the beginning of every job to say, "Listen, just tell us the truth." We'll give you the time you need as long as you tell us what you need and you don't run over. Will it? And I think, yeah, that's <laughs> spent a lot of time being like, yeah, 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 definitely. It's, it's an hour and 15. And then being like, oh my God. <laughs> Get it done yesterday. Yeah. Um, Helena Bonham Carter, she claimed she met Princess Margaret in real life, didn't she? Is that true? She did as a young woman, yeah. Really? As, as part of our research in season three, we went and had a session with her hairdressers in Mayfair. And her, as in 
Hel and Princess Margaret's old hairdressers right in their 70s and still working wow. and they were amazing and they gave us actually they lent us all of Princess Margaret's hair pieces so we could awesome. use them for color reference and texture reference we had a sample of her hair from them they were really generous with their time it was it was an amazing experience that is incredible isn't it mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was a lovely, lovely thing. And Helena was then able to have some time with them. And yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, imagine saying you've met Princess Margaret and you're playing her as well. Like how incredible would that be? Yeah. So obviously Princess Diana. Yeah. Me to talk about her. So she, the moment she came on screen, I was just absolutely gobsmacked about how much, I mean, my parents would, back me up on this I was absolutely obsessed I still am obsessed with the royal family but I was obsessed with Princess Diana when I was younger yeah. um, to the point that I probably would have had like the shaggy kind of hair that she <laughs> she had but you how you created like a no makeup makeup look on her and her to still look so much like Diana was incredible how did you create that so it was really just about thinking so we've got this beautiful young actress obviously she was a great casting to start with and the casting mm -hmm. department really helped in that most of the time in that respect but what we're thinking about is we've got we've got a girl who goes from being a 19 year old she I mean she doesn't she even starts I can't remember how old is she what 13 or something in that first scene we see mm -hmm. her and then she ends up as this kind of media worn icon so we knew we had this big journey and we had to figure out a way to tell that story that wasn't going to take hours and hours every morning. Um, and we basically, I mean, my sort of theory through life is that the more makeup you wear, typically the older you look. I'm not a huge fan of like makeup most of the time. I think it's typically, I think it can be like less flattering a lot of the time. And so actually when she was younger, we didn't use any foundation at all. We just used... Do you know a product called Le Maquillage? No. I, this is worth looking into for, for, for your students. Le Maquillage is a brand of, it's a French brand of makeup. It's in the professional makeup suppliers like Pam or Tilt in London. And they do something called the Grand Palette. So they do lots of mini palettes and they do this Grand Palette, which has loads of colors, including this kind of crazy chroma key blue that no one uses. Um, but it's a wax base. And it, it really, like when you, the colors are really weird. So you sort of have to learn the palette because you would never just be able to match them up. You sort of have to know, know how it works, but you can really mix as you go. So I love it. So I will use it religiously actually on everything. And what's great about it is it comes with, you buy a sort of, um, sort of a solvent, a thinner that comes with it that's really beautiful. And you can thin it down to almost nothing. So we would use that and it warms up with the skin because it's wax based and it looks great for period and it looks really natural. And the great thing about this grand palette, which is a couple of hundred quid, but you could take it with you and do anything with it. So you could do special effects, you can do beauty makeup, aging, anything. Um, and so we would just use a bit of kind of color correction or concealer here and there. We kept all of the shapes really, really round. So her blusher, her eyes, she had a tinted lip balm and some cream blusher. And of course she had that really kind of standard Diana eye makeup that made her mm. eyes look really, and she would stare out from under that fringe in that way that was so yeah. Diana like. Um, and of course the hair was really, that wig was very, very low key. It was cut. We had, we had a hairdresser from the eighties. I arranged come in and give us a masterclass in that very specific haircut because most of the time I think when you see people do Diana they cheat that shape with the hair all flicking backwards mm -hmm. and it isn't it's like it was a haircut and if you look at the haircut it's like this yeah really extreme it's got short layers on top it, it needs it in order, if you're going to make the style authentic. So we learned how to do that haircut because it's very different to modern hairdressing. And and then that first wig is very kind of natural, very unstyled. And we use things like we make ball pieces from silicon. So underneath, when you see when she bends over, you can see the crown of her hair and the part mm -hmm. up here. And it's because she's got ball pieces on underneath the wig to kind of mimic the scalp. Wow. So... 
that's how we started with her young look. And then we used beauty makeup to age her. So because it's the 80s and they're emphasizing every feature on their face at the same time for like the first time since the Georgians and <laughs> makeup isn't what it is now. So it was, you know, highly textured, not very sophisticated pigments, quite washy, quite cool. A lot of those blusher tones. So we would we basically built up the layers of makeup through the episodes. We'd apply it in a much more angular fashion so that her face started to get quite chiseled. And, and, and make it quite powdered and quite cold. And then we saved those kind of iconic bright blue eyeliners and mascaras for her last episode, because that's when she was, you know, she would use those as a kind of armor, like a body armor. So we would yeah. save her, make her seem more vulnerable because that's when she would, she'd start using them. Yeah, I read that somewhere that she would wear her blue eyeshadow and mascara when she was feeling quite vulnerable yeah. at a time so yeah that was really interesting to see that happen on the crown and yeah. um, we've got a few questions come through on here um do you think helena suited the crown cast or alice in wonderland yeah. harry Potter more i think i mean i can see why they cast helena and i think she totally suited princess margaret but there was a real um and, and i know she felt it we felt it when she first started in season three, she was 52 playing a 35 year old. Mm -hmm. And we all felt that pressure. And you just can't, nobody can make someone who's 52 look like they're 35. It's impossible. Olivia as well was older playing a younger queen. And it wasn't until season four when both ladies were able to play their own age that they relaxed and they were like, oh, thank God we can just, you know, be our own age and enjoy ourselves. And I think, I think, do I buy? I mean, I think Helena was brilliant, but I think it was a difficult. I think it was a difficult process to to do the younger Prince Mar Princess Margaret. Yeah, I mean, she's got incredible skin, but like you said, you can only work with so much, can't you? Well, yeah, and she looks down. She's got amazing bone structure. Mm. She's incredible. I would be thrilled if I looked like Helena Bonham Carter. Mm. Um, she knows how to like. She can act and she can work her angles and she knows what she's doing, but it's. It was definitely, it felt really nerve wracking to be the first series to entirely change the cast in a yeah. very public way. And then at the same time to do that with actors who were like, knowing they were playing much younger than their own age. Oh, hold on, I'm so sorry, there's someone at my door. That's fine, you carry on. Carry on. Carry on. So sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Do you know what? I thought this was going to be me because I ordered a new outfit for today, for today, obviously, and it was meant to come yesterday. And then Asos said it was coming between half past one and half past two. I put a note on the door. Don't yeah. knock. Don't come <laughs> to the door now. I don't want it. You can take it back. <laughs> oh, hold on. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. We've had a massive renovation project and our builders are just, they just want to come in and do some sanding. Oh, bless you. <laughs> I said, that's fine. I said, I'll just be talking in the background. That's fine. Don't um, worry. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I think she, I think she was good. Um, but I also, I think she's amazing in those like really kind of, she's got such a strong look that those fantasy roles really suit her. Yeah, definitely. It's hard actually to see her in the crown to start with because I'm so used to seeing her play such and this is so usually they don't go for such iconic mm. people. I mean I think they typically prefer people who aren't famous because yeah. again every every effort is made not to distract you from the actual narrative the whole thing is about creating this kind of robust world that as a viewer is so authentic that you don't really think about all of that stuff and I think probably with Olivia and Helena as brilliant as they were I think for a lot of people, it took a little while to get over who they were and to sort of accept. Whereas, of course, Claire Foy and Vanessa Kirby, when they started, were totally unknown. So that, that wasn't distracting at all. Yeah, I heard, I read somewhere that the first um, queen in seasons one and two, they overlooked her a few times and weren't going to cast mm -hmm. her. They had someone else. Yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, I read that somewhere. That was interesting. Amazing. Yeah. Someone's put a question here, um, which is a good one. Do the actors and actresses ever give any input to the design of their makeup or is it a set? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, like, 
they're, they're more likely to tell you what they don't like mm -hmm. and what doesn't work and what hasn't worked for them in the past. And then, I mean, like Olivia, it's funny, they're just all different. So Helena really knows her face and she knows her angles and she takes a really keen interest in what you're doing. And then once you're sort of going and established, then she's not really, like, she just just doesn't really pay any attention at all. Yeah. And Olivia actively doesn't want to know. Olivia is so sort of non-fussed that she's like, she doesn't really want to engage with it. She's like, she just loves that, like, she loves being in the chair and she loves the social and she loves the cup of tea Aww. and chatting. She's gorgeous, but yeah. she doesn't, like, there's a, just a difference between some actors are really instinctive with how they work so for Olivia, she comes in, she gets made into the queen and then poof, that's it. She just does it. Whereas yes. Helen's a bit more of a grafter. So she needs she needs to go through that process and through that prep process with you to sort of then inhabit the character. And Olivia Coleman, did she have any prosthetics or did you just gradually age her as the episodes went on with yeah, makeup? No, no, no prosthetics at all. We tried this oxygen facial. Have you heard of oxygen facials? Yeah. So I totally got into bed with the devil and blagged this £10,000 oxygen facial machine for the first series in the hope that it would suddenly make all of our past 20 years younger. And of course, <laughs> not only did it not do that, but it was really time consuming. And it was all Helen's fault because she was like, we should get this machine. And I was like, OK. And I borrowed it. And then it was a complete nightmare. Oh. Um, but, but we tried contacts with Olivia. But again, they were because what we were worried about was the little flexible coloured contacts. You can still see the edge of the contact lens along on the white of the eye. Mm -hmm. So instead, we tried making the glass the full. There are full eye contact that go right around here, so that you can't see the edge. And they're made of glass and they're hand painted. And Olivia's super squeamish, so they would literally sort of have to pin her down crowbar it in and then she was <laughs> sat there it was so funny the day of her first camera test she sort of sat there with these massive bug eyes that looked about an inch bigger than normal <laughs> and then me and the producers were, were all just like this isn't this isn't a thing this is a really expensive what time waste and they looked into cgiing her eye color and again they just felt it detracted from her performance yeah that's incredible didn't yeah. even yeah, I didn't even know you could do that. Yeah. Um, and again, the aging we did it was mainly this thing where the, the 80s makeup is quite aging. So, you know, as, as we went from the 60s into the 70s into the 80s, just by virtue of using those sort of shimmery, textured, pink and cool tones, and uh, it just did age her and more powder. Yeah. Someone's put here, what qualifications did you get to get the job you have? I really want to get into the makeup industry. Well, Sophie underscore one, you can apply at Wiltshire College. We are taking applicants now. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there are loads, there's loads of different ways to get in, like I said. And once you're in, there's loads of different ways to kind of progress. Um, and, and being a designer is one career. But loads of my friends have absolutely no ambition to be a head of department designer. Most of my friends are like, no, thank you. They're really, I've got friends who are career supervisors because they're really, really good at organizing and paperwork and scheduling. I've got friends who run crowd rooms because they really like the whole challenge of making big groups of people look like they're from a certain era. But in crowd, you have to be a bit more creative because you don't get your Rolls Royce of wigs. You get you know some tatty old synthetic thing and you have to sort of make it work and it doesn't have to work in close-up it just has to work in a broad thing or I've got friends who are just sort of career hair and makeup artists so there's loads of different routes once you're qualified and to get qualified you need to do a hair and makeup course somewhere and and you can do one at one of the really expensive London makeup schools but there are loads of colleges now offering media makeup. And once you're qualified, you sort of end up in the same position as anyone else graduating from any makeup course, which is you have to work for free and it's a nightmare and you're going to have to get a job on a makeup counter to build up your kit. And you'll probably have to do weddings. And it's, it's just about how long you persevere until you find that you're actually getting enough work. I've got friends, I worked in news, in between all my film jobs, I've worked as a news makeup person, as a freelancer, as a sort of bread and butter job. But I've got friends who only work in news and they're really often unsatisfied by it. 
So some people love that. Some people just do sort of tele presenters. They don't do any character makeup. Um, some people just do special effects. So I think there's loads. The thing I would say, my biggest piece of advice for, for anybody who's interested is, is get your hair dressing skills because the idea that you can just be a makeup artist, I think is really limited and you won't earn enough money. And if you can, while you're young and while you can afford to even go to night school to get your MVQ hairdressing and work in a salon for a year, that is going to do two things. One, it's going to mean that you can always earn a living. So when you're trying to do all these really free makeup and hair jobs, you can also work part time in a salon and actually pay your rent. And it's going to make you different to all the other trainees. So I rarely hire a trainee that doesn't have a salon background. Mm -hmm. As you get older, it gets harder and harder. Like I'm not going to go back to a salon now. Um, and I wish I'd have known as it as a as a young person because you can just go to night school and do that. You don't even need to do it at the same time as you do your makeup course. Yeah. Thank you. That's really good. Someone said, um, "What was Julian like to work with?" Oh, she was a total dream. So she and I had worked together on Crooked House. Oh, of course. So normally you have a period of time where you're trying to win someone over and you're trying to gain their trust. And luckily, I just had her trust from the beginning on The Crown and that sort of saved a load of energy and a load of effort. And she um, she's a, she sort of does her homework and she likes to get things right, but she also is sort of happy to go down on the journey with you. And we just did lots of, lots of experimenting. We went through about six different pairs of teeth because Thatcher went through the whole teeth journey, which we didn't end up telling that story on camera, but, you know, she had loads of dental work done through the 80s. So for a time, we were sort of trying to recreate all of those things. And Gillian looked like Ken Dodd, and it was all a bit um, hokey. And I think that's the thing, because we're recreating real people. We're always trying to find this fine balance between something that's hokey and it is a, a sort of parody and something that feels real. So, yeah, she was... She's a dream. She's a friend. She's like one of the few people that I would How say. How amazing is it to say that? Yeah, she's a good friend. So someone's put, obviously we have kind of spoke about this, but someone said, did you prefer working on the young queen or the older ones looking, I suppose, because of the age? Yeah, I found season four, um, like I think like the cast did, just a, a way more relaxing process because it felt like we stood a hope in hell of achieving it. And I think from the off with season three, we could always give it our best shot. And I and I think it was good, but we were never going to really manage to make them look that young. So for, I think for all of us, season four just felt like an achievable goal. <laughs> yeah. Someone said, what's the hardest hairstyle you had to do for the film or series? Was that Margaret Thatcher's, would you say? No, well, it's once we got it, this is the thing they all take, you have to keep kind of fiddling with them and practicing and trying. And when we first started on Thatcher, it was a very glossy period do, and it was the right roller sets and it was the right shape, but the texture of the hair was wrong. And that's because what we sort of eventually realized was that we had to destroy the wig and we had to destroy the hair texture in the wig. But of course, intuitively that feels really wrong. So you go through, camera test after camera test, just going, oh, it's not quite right. And no one can quite work out what it is. And it just gradually we hit upon a process that worked. Um, to be honest, I think the men's, the men's wigs are the hardest because you're not hiding behind a big hairstyle and you're trying to, you're trying to sell them like it's real. But, you know, if you think about, so one of the characters, John Major in season four, the actor did his, we get those bit parts, we get them really close to when we shoot. We don't have the, the kind of luxury of the big run up. And he, in his screen test, had put a kind of fake gray hair wax on his hair because it was a low resolution, no one knew. So when he came to me a week before we were due to shoot with him with black, black, black hair and black eyebrows, and it was so dense and the hairline was so prominent, there's this, um, the challenge of making a wig work over hair like that and look authentic is is really intense. And actually, when I watched season four, the one that nobody would care about because he doesn't even speak was John Major. And I was like, yes, this John Major works. 
So I think it's funny because it's never the hairstyles you'd imagine that are the most difficult, but you know. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, yeah, I would never, didn't, didn't even think about the guys, but yeah, of course. Um, someone says, has production started on season five yet? Yeah, so I'm researching season five at the moment and we start shooting in July. So exciting. The new Queen and the new Princess Margaret and the new Diana, it's all happening. So excited for that. It's been the only thing that's got me through this third lockdown is watching The Crown again. <laughs> um, were any of the wigs really heavy for the actors to work with? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, the Princess Margaret ones were season three because we would have, they were full wigs and then we would have pieces in addition. So they would be like, they were insane, some of those. But not really, not like, I think the thing that's more cumbersome for the actors is that the the degree that we wrap the hair underneath so the hair is so tightly and strategically wrapped with ball pieces and coloring in and gel and clips and everything so that we can make it as flat as possible and get all the hair sitting in the right direction to mimic the hair that's going to then sit on top i think that is more it, it kind of creates more tension in the head than the actual weight of the wig okay and then someone said, how many more seasons will there be? And that's quite an interesting question because I read somewhere that they will not feature the royals of today. No, definitely not. No. He's a his he writes historical fiction and mm -hmm. I think I think he would agree with me. I don't know, I've not asked him. But you need in order to write historical fiction, you need perspective. Mm -hmm. And so you can't really write about what's happening today with any kind of perspective. So I think I think 2004 is about when it will run up to. Okay. Season five and season six. They were talking about just doing season five, which I think we were all, we all thought was a good idea, but then he just writes and writes and writes. So then he's like, actually, I've got enough material for season six. Why not? Let's do it. So, and then it was going to be eight episodes and now it's back to 10. And so I think Peter Morgan's a sort of unstoppable writing machine. <laughs> That's interesting. And someone said, do you have any upcoming dramas or series you're working on other than The Crown, obviously, that you're going to be starting and filming soon? No. Since I've been on The Crown, it's been my, um, sort of been everything, really. It's it, Because it was such a huge endeavour just after I'd had my baby, this year was always intending to be a kind of maternity leave. Mm -hmm. So I, I retrained, actually, and, did, and learned to do something else this year and have been working a little bit in that. But um, I... I I sort of feel like I found my my people with the crown. They're really nice. They're really cool. And having sort of proved myself, it, it means I don't have to make any effort whatsoever to prove myself to anybody else. So from a lazy point of view, I don't really want to work with anybody else now. <laughs> You've done your hard graft. You've earned and that. I'm like, I'm like, I just can't be bothered to go in and meet new people again. And the, the crown is this sort of big network of people that, and you know everybody. And so I sort of like, lazily don't really want to go and work on other productions i just want to work with them someone has said do you think any of the members of the royal family have watched the crown yeah i know they have i know they have and i know and i don't know about season four but i know that up in, before season three the queen had watched it and thought it was all right and that prince philip didn't like it and i suspect now that we are getting more up to date i think it's a slightly more conflicted situation so it's not something I'd really want to go into but we have a we have a royal advisor major David mm -hmm. who is, is David Rankin Hunt is part of the royal household and as well he's military and you know so in, in that respect we really try to do everything authentically and and nobody is sort of setting out to humiliate or upset the royal family so um yeah so lovely and i said have you got other job opportunities from working with the cast from the crown yeah i mean jillian asked this week if she's doing a job in america and she's like do you want to come in personal but i've got a child and a family so and i'm shooting the crown so it's, it's a no-go um sue who looked after olivia my friend sue is now on a film with her as a personal and is sort of following her around a bit um it's you definitely do like if you get on with actors they definitely end up with more opportunities and because of the crown i yeah i get called by other people to do other things 
I did have an agent before like I, I left because I just thought again I just don't want to work with anyone else so why pay an agent you know to find other work so yeah it's a really fortunate it's quite an unusual position to be in for a freelance industry but before I got all of my work through recommendation from working on films lovely and someone said what kind of hours do you do roughly on a set I mean they are they're back breaking so and it depends on the day but if you're you know you're out of bed at 4 4 30 they're in you have to get there half an hour before the cast get there probably because you're turning on electrical equipment like rollers that have to heat up obviously the wigs are dressed in advance but even if you've got a dressed wig you have to unblock the wig with its hundred tiny pins and you have to make maybe dress the baby hairs on the front you may maybe the makeup truck has moved for to a new location so you have to unpack all your stuff and get ready and then and you might well be on location an hour and a half from where you live so if you need to get there at six you have to leave at half past four and um and then you shoot so they're on camera at eight typically on the crown they'll be off camera by six half past six if they they don't because we shoot for seven months they try not to make us do 12 hour days on camera yeah and if they're off camera at half past six they'll be de-rigged by seven and then the wigs will be redressed and reset so sometimes even then you're not away until eight which means home at half past nine and up again at four so when you're in that rhythm and it's again it's different it's different for me because i'm the designer so I might be in a sort of fittings rhythm, doing or meetings, prep, doing other stuff. Um, but if you're an artist and you're on set all day, every day, that, that's the hours you're doing typically. Okay. Someone said, have you had to adapt your way of working during COVID and lockdown? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I haven't worked because the, the Crown got shut down in its last week of filming which, which was fortunate we we'd mainly filmed everything and they managed to cut it together um but when i went back to do wig fittings last week yeah there's a there's covid protocol and risk assessments and we are we're wearing like biosecure masks and visors and aprons and and you can't wear gloves for a fitting but there's a whole new regimen that is it's like an industry standard now there are already covid supervisors is a job and that's a thing yeah. now in film and we're all tested every couple of days. So you're on a kind of, you don't go near an actor without being tested. Um, and it's like the new normal already. It's quite scary really, isn't it? I thought it was gonna be over and I'm dreading it. In truth, I am dreading it because there's perspex screens between the makeup stations on the trucks. Wow. Which just seems like overkill to me. And, you know, part of the, the reason I love my job is because I hire all my best friends and we work as a team and we have a really, really good time. Yeah. I don't, and like, it's quite a huggy industry and I'm not really sure how to bond with my new cast if I can't give them a hug. <laughs> yeah, it's really difficult, isn't it? Someone said, what was it like working with Matt Smith? As in from Friends? Oh no, Matt Smith, Matt the first and that's that's a different one. Matt LeBlanc is from Friends. Yeah. <laughs> was the first Prince Philip, but I didn't do seasons one and two, so no, no idea. Who is an actor you'd like to work with that you haven't before? Ooh, interesting. Mark Rylance. Mm. Um, he is incredible. He's a Shakespearean, does a lot of theatre. Um, and he he and I did the same gap year at the same college in Stratford, and then he lived in Herne Hill in London when I lived there, and I never met him. So I'm sort of desperate to uh, desperate to work with him. I love him. He was in the Warpool. Um, he played Cornwall in the Warpool series. Interesting. Um, how long did it take you to create the wigs? And how many people were working on them, roughly? So Alex Rouse has a workshop and a team of probably 20. But she has freelancers working for her as well who do piecework. So they'll have a wig sent out to have a new front put on it and sent back again. Um, the wigs take probably three weeks to make a full wig. They take a week every time one is refronted. And then we go between a wig coming to us. If you look on Instagram, Stacey Holman, who is, she looked after Gillian on my job. Um, she's my good friend, but she's really good at posting and you can see how the wigs come to us. So they come with beautiful, shiny hair, loads of hair in them. So. The first time we get them box fresh, they'll be we razor the hell out of them, thin them out because the worst thing that looks wiggy is loads and loads of hair in a wig. 
Mm -hmm. So once we have spent ages razoring them, they are then cut to shape. Usually with a razor, it's it's almost like sculpture. It's like topiary. You're not kind of, do you know what I mean? It's not, um, it's almost like bad hairdressing. So often we cut them with thinning scissors because sharp angles on a wig will look really obvious on camera and and just don't work. Whereas if you soften the ends and you soften everything all the time. um, So they're cut to shape and then they are, on the block they are wet set with rollers so they're soaking wet then they're baked in the wig oven and then they're dressed out but then the process of actually cutting them on the actor's head and fitting them is probably three six hour fittings just Mm -hmm. for every wig just to get to the point where it's possible to use it on camera wow someone said what was all the outfits like they look gorgeous Yeah, it's not really my department. It's in no. the like it's a costume department. Yeah, and they are um, amazing. Do so you get to see the actors and actresses while well, they're acting? Yeah, so you're it, obviously you get them ready in the morning, but your job isn't to get them ready and then because they would they would look a dog's dinner. So for every shot, every time your camera is moved to a different angle, and your shot might be a big wide shot, it might be a tiny close up. You're looking for the <clears throat> you're looking to look after them so you're looking for the specific details that work in that shot with the lighting so every time they change the lighting or the lens or the angle your hair and makeup might not work so your wig might look distorted through no fault of your own and you might have to try and tweak the shape you might be able to see one tiny hair poking out from the light um you know makeup runs actors eat actors are a nightmare you know they end up like looking crazy like they've been through a hedge so and then every time they finish a scene you might then have to change them for their look for the the continuity for the next scene Mm -hmm. or even if they're just going off for a cup of tea we'll put headscarves over their wigs to protect them because they are a total liability Helena Bonham Carter being (laughs) Gillian is like an immaculate lady who would just she would just not mess up her wig whereas Helena wouldn't think about it and would be having a great time and then you'd be like what did you do (laughs) just imagine them being like their characters as you're describing this they are and they're all so much fun and they're all so different and they're all lovely but yeah it is this it's a constant thing of just running around after them trying to keep them kind of looking fresh all day for 12 hours which is really difficult yeah I can imagine well thank you so so much for your time on behalf of myself and Wiltshire College it's been really inspiring and just lovely to pick your brain so thank you for being so lovely it's such a pleasure and thank you for being so complimentary about the show and I would just say to anybody who wants to do hair and makeup just stick it out and and you'll get there it just takes it takes ages and it's quite disheartening but it's like this tiny snowball that rolls and rolls and rolls and it's at some point becomes something that's sort of palpable and you can you're like oh I'm doing it now but it takes a while thank you so much Kate everyone good luck and take care of yourself thank you take care Kate Bye. bye bye